Welcome to GBBC. We are so glad you have chosen to join us in worship this morning. If you are new here, we would like to say thank you and tell you about what to expect. We have a simple threefold purpose. Connect to Jesus and his church, grow in the word, and serve through loving God and loving others. For us, that not only means gathering on Sunday, but then showing the love of God by serving our community every single day. If you have kids, we have a perfect place for them to get plugged in. On Sundays and Wednesdays, our kids and teens have classes designed just for them, where they are learning what it means to follow Jesus and love others with the love of Christ. If you have small children, we have nursery available. Our staff of trained, background-checked workers will provide a safe, loving environment for them while you are enjoying our worship service. Here in just a moment, our worship service will begin. We will have a time of singing and prayer and followed by a message brought straight from the Bible. At the end of the message, we will have what is called an invitation. This is an opportunity for everyone to pray and for you to contact our church if you have any questions about the preaching you, you have just heard or about following Jesus in general. Now silence your phones, grab your Bible, find your seat, and join us in congregational singing as our service begins. song this morning. We were able to sing this morning because of the cross, so we're going to sing at the cross this morning as we prepare for the altar. Alas, and did my Savior be, and did my sovereign die? Would he be both that sacred head for such a word as I? At the cross that
At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Maybe you came here this morning carrying a burden opportunity to take that burden and lay it at the cross at the feet of Jesus. He's willing and ready to forgive and to restore. So thank the Lord and praise the Lord for his mercies and love. You may be seated. And because of that it is quite a debt we owe, isn't it? And uh, we can give ourselves to him and that's what we can do. It is good to be here this morning. I just want to make mention of a few things. Grab a bulletin if you've not done so. Uh, on Wednesday night, we'll resume our regular Wednesday evening Bible study. We finished up our classes this last week, uh, so uh, come on back. Let's get back into gear and get back in school started. I didn't think I'd get much on that, but uh, so school started. We can get into a routine, so I just encourage you to get back in on Wednesday night. Uh, enjoy that fellowship. Again, you thank you for been giving. We have the tithing uh, boxes out in the foyer. You can drop your tithes and offerings off in there, or you can go to Grayson bbc.com and uh, give your tithes and offering there again we're glad to have our guest with us this morning hopefully the service will be a blessing to you and let's go together in prayer and we'll ask blessing over the offering and the remainder of our service father we come before you we're so grateful for your love we're grateful for another day that you've given us to meet together in your house we thank for thank you for the freedoms that we have that we can openly worship and serve you and god i pray that you would just bless those that are here under this roof this morning, those that are joining us via the internet, that you'd speak to our hearts through the preaching of your word. If there's someone here or watching that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that you would speak to them. They might come and receive you today. Lord, we ask you to bless the offerings. You bless the ministry of the church here and around the world. We ask you to bless our missionaries as they reach, uh, they seek to reach souls on their given field. We pray that you'd meet their needs and you'd take care of them. God, we ask you just to go before us and guide us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're certainly thankful to have uh, Dr. Johnson, his wife, here this morning, Mrs. Johnson, and uh, we're excited to have him come and preach to us. Uh, you know, 
Brother Johnson took a chance on me 21 years ago when he hired me on staff, and so you can blame him for that if you want to later on. Uh, but, you know, you have mentors in your life, and I can certainly uh, count Brother Johnson as, a, as my, one of my Pauls in my life and uh, pouring himself into me, and I appreciate that. So I asked Brother Johnson if you would come and preach to us, preach to us this morning. You give him a good grace and Bible Baptist welcome. We'll do something. It'd be easier to just go ahead and kiss, wouldn't it? <laughs> You'd say, well, be careful there. Well, you know, the Bible says, greet the brethren with a holy kiss. Amen. And so we're glad to be here. We thank Brother Roy for asking us to preach in his absence. And I know that uh, in past years and things, and not long at all, John, John and I have known many. Could be. All right, there I am. Okay. I thought maybe he was doing like he usually did, just tried to turn me off. So. But I do appreciate the opportunity of being back today and preaching for you this morning. And so hopefully we'll be able to watch our time schedule and things of that nature and get out. You never get through with a message. You just quit somewhere along the way. And uh, so I've got this one so that we have 14 stopping points if I need them. But nonetheless, so we'll do the best we can. But it's good to be here and it's uh, good to have Brother and Miss Webster here today and we don't get to see him often, of course, he's always going someplace, and Miss Johnson and I have been here, there, and the other for a few few years, and so, but uh, the Lord just uh, has to do what he has to do when he wants to do it, amen? Uh, this morning, I have a message, I hope it'll be a message of encouragement, but you'll have to use your Bible, because uh, I never have been real easy to just take one verse and go from there and jump off and swim the rest of the day. But if you'll open your Bibles to begin with to the Hebrews chapter 12, we'll go there and we'll be looking back to Hebrews chapter 10 as well uh, through the introductions and then we'll go into the Old Testament and talk about it. The entitled message this morning is just exactly what God asked. He said uh, he sought for a man who would stand in the gap. You know, we are in a very uh, uh, different time. And, of course, with the virus and everything that's going on and everything else, we find ourselves wondering exactly, and many people are saying, well, what is the church going to be like when it comes out on the other side? Well, it shouldn't change. It's the church. It's God's business, and it's not man's, and so we need to leave that up. But nonetheless, anyhow, in Hebrews chapter 10, and I said verse 12, uh, chapter 12, we'll go there in a moment, but in verse number 38, Paul is writing, and he is getting ready to really talk to the believers. He's been talking about the superiority of Christ all the way through this point. And so now he's going to ask them some questions. And he's going to quote from out of the book of Habakkuk. And he's going to say this, if you notice with me in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 38. He said, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them which draw back unto the perdition but of them which believe to the saving of the soul. Now Paul now, basically as he comes to Hebrew, and I believe he's the writer, he quotes for the third time this statement, and the just shall live by faith, which, come out, which comes out of the book of Habakkuk. And each time he emphasizes it some, some different way. And in Romans, where he gives it to us, he says the just, those that have been justified by grace and have become children of God saved by the blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants us to understand that you must be justified. Now that is nothing other than a legal statement, just simply meaning that God has died for your sins and standing before him you stand justified just as if you had never sinned. Then when he moves on and he gets to the book of Galatians in chapter 3, he talks about it again and he said, and the just shall live. Of course, the book of Galatians, we know, has basically been given the Christian Magna Carta where we have the liberty. We're not under law, we're under grace. That doesn't mean we have a license to sin or to do what we want to. It means that we have the right to do what God wants us to do. And then when we come to Hebrews and he's mentioning this, he's wanting us to know that the just live by faith. Now that's a very crucial thing because, you know, we are saved by faith. 
without faith there is no repentance because Corinth or Acts rather tells us that there must be repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Same coin on both sides, but it takes repentance and faith. You cannot go either way. And so Paul now is getting ready to talk to them about the examples of faith uh, through the chapter 11 as he does. He brings all these things to them and, and he tells us in verse 3, you know, through faith. He tells us then in verse number 4, by faith. And in 5, by faith. He goes on, and I'm not going to go through all those, but he gives us all these examples. And then when he moves into Hebrews chapter 12, he makes this statement then in verse number 1. He said, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight. Now, a lot of times in the preaching, if we're not careful, we will get to something and we will make an example out of it, which is not a good example. A lot of times when we get this and we talk about every weight, it's talking about the practice of the runner. He puts the weight around his ankles and, you know, or whatever the case is in order to get him prepared to running the race. You, you can't put that there here because this is the race is running. It's not something you're going to be doing. You're doing it now. The day that you got saved, you began the race. And he wanted us to understand it. So those weights that we have or those burdens or those habits that we brought into this race with us, and they are so easily besetting us all the way. And he wants us to understand that. Look at it as we read it. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight. And that is those things that, that you know, hang on to us. Sometimes it's guilt. We don't seem to be able to get rid of it. Because, see, even though God forgives us and forgets it, we don't. It'll carry with us from now on. And he, he wants us to understand that these are the things that come in that encircle us. And then he goes on, that they, the weights that so easily beset us. And then notice what he says next, and he said this. And uh, let us uh, lay aside every weight. And then notice this, the sin. It's not plural. It's singular. And you also have to remember this, that once you have been saved, all your sins are forgiven. Okay, and a lot of times, you know, if we're not careful, we'll want to think about the judgment seat of Christ and how that these sins, you know, that we've committed sin, sin will come up. But, you know, they can't come up because they've been forgotten. God's forgotten them. They're as far as the east is from the west. Only thing you and I've got to worry about is getting when we get there is the rest of this verse. Okay, this, the sin that he's talking about, I believe it's the sin of a lack of faith. Because the sin, and that's the only thing that keep, can keep you from going to heaven, is, is the lack of faith in believing and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the sin here, I think, is the lack of faith. And the lack of faith that we have to really run the race that he set before us. Notice in the rest of the verse, he goes on and says this, the sin which does so easily uh, beset us, let us run the race with patience, the race that is set before us. Now, when we begin to look at that, we realize immediately that we have a race to run. Now, you know, God knew that all this was going to happen. This, this was not something that caught God off guard when we came into this virus situation. That was not it at all. The problem is, is where is our faith gone? It, we're, we're trying to trust everything else except God. And, and we cannot get there. We cannot do that. And that's what God wants us to understand. We've got a world full of sin. And, and America is going uh, to hell in a basket because they're so proud of the wickedness because we've put God out of everything. But now a lot of people want to put God back in but they're afraid to get too much church because they're afraid that something will happen. You've got to remember that when you die, you're going to heaven, okay? And our problem is we put too much love in this world instead of our love in our, uh, our, our place of, of our final abode, which God died that he might give us. Are you with me yet? All right. And, and you know, when we, have, we bury our loved ones, the first thing we tell everybody, they're better off. They're better off. Man, just think, we'd like to be there. Can you only imagine? But then if anything comes scary, we start running like a scared rabbit. Are you with me yet? Well, you better say amen. Y'all know me. 
I can preach by the calendar or I can preach by the clock. It doesn't bother me. All right? Okay, so, you know, so he wants us to understand this. Let us run the race. Now, you've got a race. God knew that this was going to be here. And he's wondering what's happening to us. Are we going to run our race or not? Let me ask you this question. Years ago, I'd asked this question when I was preaching youth meetings and things of this nature and talking to the youth about their life and how it was so easy that they could, you know, as Brother Bishop used to tell us all the time, it's so easy to sacrifice the future on the altar of the present. It only takes one minute to mess your life up. And you and I have to understand. So let me ask you something today with all that's going on and everything else. Where are you going to be when you get where you're going? Where are you going to be where you get where you're going? I, I'm not talking about where you plan to be. I'm not talking about what your dreams are, but the way you're living your life and the things that you're doing, where are you going to be when you get where you're going? I'm, I'm talking about running your race. You've got a race, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. The man that's willing to stand in the gap. Go back with me, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 22. Now, we'll have to take a time to form all this together and try to get it together, but I'll do my best to try to stay close to time anyhow. Brother Roy is very good at that. I'm very bad at it, you know. But nonetheless, I want you to notice, when we get over to Ezekiel chapter 22, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but it, if Israel is in sin again. That was their favorite thing to do. Get out and get in. Get out and get in. That's our favorite thing to do. We get right, we get out. We get right, we get out. We get right, we get out. And, and, and you know, God understands that. He doesn't like it. But he understands it because we're made of clay. And he's done everything he can to help us to overcome those things. But in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 1, it said, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now the Son of Man, wilt thou judge? Wilt thou judge the bloody city? Yea, thou that show her all, show her, all her abomination." Then thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord God, The city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that, her, that their time may come, and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. That almost looks like talk about America, doesn't it? Not? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to go through all that, but basically what he does, he begins to talk about Israel and their sins to the point that he says, I'm going to judge you. And I'm going to basically give you an illustration to do this. We're in Ezekiel chapter 22. I'm going to give you an illustration of how we're going to do that. It's like we would take all the gold and all the silver and everything else, and we're going to bring it in and we're going to start melting it. Because he said, you're nothing but dr the dross that's going to come out of it. In other words, you're nothing but the scum that comes from the melting of the metal. And that's what happens. That's what's happening in our country, and that's what's happening in our world. That's what's happening in our lives and our families. You know, we, we've, we've, made, we've made a mockery of everything that God wants us to be and do. And, and so it, it's not, it, as he comes through this chapter, he wants us to understand he's not talking about just one group of people. He's talking about all the people. Notice, if you would, in verse 24. And son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon uh, in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravaging the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken their treasures and precious things. And they have made her many widows in, in the midst thereof. He's, he's talking about at this particular time when, when things ought to be going right and things ought to be looking and, and people would begin to really talk about God and saying, as, as we were told in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by the name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal their land. But we're not doing too much of that. We're not doing too much of that. And so here he's talking about this, and the first thing he begins to talk about is the prophets. We have such a sad day in which we live, and, and everybody's, everybody's trying to make everything legal. You can make it legal as much as you want to, but that doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it okay with God. You know, you can't change God's plan. You, it's just an impossibility. You cannot try and put your recipe with something else. In fact, in back in Hebrews chapter 11 where he said, Now the faith is the substance of things, uh, substance of things not seen, the evidence of things. So you've got to realize now, faith is not something that's just out there for nothing. Safe, faith is the substance of the things, I'll get it right now hoped for. 
you have to give me a minute every once in a while, you know. I'm, I am a little older than I used to be. Not much. And I'm not an antique. I am a classic. Okay. Just wanna, I just want you to know that, you know, so you wouldn't, get, you wouldn't get messed up here. But anyhow, and so he's wanting us to understand. See, basically, uh, here we have that. He's given us understanding here. Now, faith is the substance. That's the reality. It's not a wishful dream. What your faith is in something solid, and that's the Word of God. That's where our hope comes from. It comes from the Word of God, and Jesus Christ is our hope. And without Him, we have nothing. It's not, a, it's not a set of rules. It's a man that died for us on the cross of Calvary. And he wanted us to understand that's our, that's our substance of the things hoped for. And then as we live it out, that's the evidence. That's the evidence. And that's what James said. Show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. And that's what he's talking about. Well, let's get on now so we can see what he's talking about. We're talking about running that race. And so now he's what he's wanting us to see now is all the conspiracies that's going on. And then notice in verse 26, I'm just going to read this, the parts here. Her priests have violated my laws and profaned my holy things. Now that's where we're seeing today. All the religion is okaying everything. Everything's okay, but everything's not okay with God. That's the same with him. Now notice if you would then verse 20, uh, 27. Her princes in the midst thereof are like raving wolf, or wolves ravaging the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. That, that would sound like uh, most of our politicians. All right, now notice as you go on, and then verse 28, again he talks about it. And her prophets have uh, dubbed them with untempered mortar. And, and the, what they're preaching today isn't worth a flip. There is no easy, belie easy believism. There is no easy Christian life. It's going to be tough, and that's what God said. He said, if my people will understand this, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, a hard road to travel if you're going to live a just life. You will suffer persecution. And, and, and we're going to suffer more and more and more because we know that as we get closer to the last days, and we are in the last days, according to the Scripture, we were when they were written, and they're going on. But now notice that we want to go on then, and he said again in verse 29, the people of the land have used oppression and ex ex exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy, and yea, they have opposed the, the stranger wrongfully, and I sought for a man. He said, I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. But I found none. You know, that's a very sad thing, that God was looking for somebody, just as it was in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. Everybody had been looking at the king. You know, you got to remember, the king, the heart's in the hand of the Lord. And he knows whether we're going to need a good king or a bad king. He knows whether our sin is overtaking us or not. Why do you think that he put in certain enemy to come in and take over Israel and to teach them a lesson so that they would remember they must have God. But he said this, I'm seeking for a man. Now in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter uh, 26, I think it is, I don't remember exactly for sure. I could turn over there in just a moment and find it and we could see it there in Isaiah, if you would, 60 in verse number 16, I believe it is. And... Uh, or, or 26, well, I don't remember what it was. But anyhow, it doesn't make any difference. He, I'll, I'll give you what it said, okay? And you can look it up in your concordance. He saw, basically, he said, he wondered, he wondered, he was in astonishment that there was no intercessor. And I'm wondering in today why we don't, we're not having intercessory meetings during this pandemic for God to do something in America. Instead of less church, we need to have a lot more prayer meetings. Well, now, don't misunderstand that. I'm, I'm not trying to say what Brother Roy should do or should not do. I'm talking about Christendom in general, okay? So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But what I want us to see is this, is God said this. He wondered there was no intercessor, but he was looking for a man. He was looking for a man to fill in the gap. Go with me, if you would, uh, back over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. That's where we want to go, and we want to begin our message today in, in this area, 1 Samuel, I mean, yeah, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And, and, and we find, uh, 
we find a very sad event taking place. You're all very familiar with it. Your Bible should be marked up like a, a, a coloring page there with all the notes and everything you have out of Isaiah chapter, I mean out of 1 Samuel 17, because this is a, the whole thing about David and Goliath. David and Goliath. Now here we find ourselves, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together the armies to battle and were gathered together at Shukah, which belongs unto Judah and pitched between uh, Shokah and, and, uh, and any of all those places. And notice if you would. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched in the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. Now they've set it in array. In other words, all they've done is they've marched up on one side of the mountain and the others are watched up on the other side of the valley, on the other mountain over there. They're looking at each other. And it's time for them. Somebody's got to fight. Well, the Philistines have decided they've got a good way to handle it. And so there's one big guy, and you know him, verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath. You're familiar with that, aren't you? Okay, there's not any need in me having to read all the verses, so let's think for just a minute what happened. And, and so here they are. Everybody goes out, and oh, Goliath comes out, and he begins to defy the sons of the living God, and, and he begins to talk to them. And he said, hey, I tell you what let's do. Let's make this easy so nobody but get hurt. You get a guy and send him out here, and I'll fight him, and if he beats me, then we'll be your servants, and if I beat him, then you'll be our servants. That would be real easy, but it's no problem at all. I'm just going to draw a line in the sand. You send one guy out. Do you all remember that? You as kids, here's a line. I dare you, I double dog dare you to cross over it. Yeah. If you do, I'll swat you in the nose. Okay. They don't do that anymore. But then nonetheless, anyhow, so there they were, and Goliath made this okay. And, and so what happened? Saul and everybody else. Now, Saul was head and shoulder of everybody else. But all of them, like, like, like scared ducklings, started hiding. They started hiding. They was needing the man. Well, God, you know what's going on, just like he knows what's going on here today. And so God speaks to Jesse and says, Now, Jesse, you need to see about your boys down there at the battle. And so he gets his youngest son, David, and he said, David, take this cheese and bread and go down there and see about your brothers and give the captain cake and all this kind of stuff. Make it easy for them, you know. We send them out there to fight, and we know, we know that they're going to take care of it. They were scared. You know, that's what happens to us. It's easy for us to get scared. Are you all with me? Some of you are and some of you ain't. And so you wonder where we're going. And so David gets there, you know, and what happens. And all of a sudden, David hears this. Goliath comes out and he defies God and all of a sudden. And, and, and he said, now send somebody out. And David looked around and looked around and he said, uh, who's going? He looked at his big brother. He's the big brother. He's the mean one. You know, he's, he's mean as the devil. And so David looks at him, and, and his big brother said, why don't you go home and take care of them little sheep you got? And David looked at him and said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And so I'm asking, God was looking for a man to stand in the gap. David said, bless God, I'll do it. I killed a bear and a lion. The Lord gave me power to do it. And I mean, I, he said, I, I can do it. I can do it. You ain't nothing but a little old bitty shrimp. Go on home and take care of them few sheep. But somebody heard it, you know, and they said, told Saul. And Saul said, bring him up here. So they bring this little kid up. You know, everybody says he's a ruby face, sort of red, and got red hair, and and I'm sure he's a good-looking young man and probably got a little bit of muscle, but he's a kid. And Saul is just like Rexo. He scared to death. But, you know, there's one thing about it, see, as things progress along, as David progresses along, you know, he, he, all of a sudden we're finding David now is inspiring confidence. Saul and everybody's afraid, scared to death. And David said, hey, boys, we can do this. Just put me out there. Just let me have them. Open it up and let me go. Just let me go. Let me go. And Saul said, we'll fix you up real quick. And so they put all of Saul's armor on him. They could have at least got the little guy in the town to get his armor, couldn't they? But no, they got the biggest they could find. And he waddled around like a duck. You've heard it told a thousand times. But all of a sudden, 
because somebody, somebody said, I'll stand in the gap. I'll stand in the gap. And so they got him off the ship. And David said, hey, if you'll just back up and let me have my slingshot and my pouch. And, and he walked across that river. I started to bring some rocks that we brought back from the, down the valley of El, Ella when we were there uh, back years ago. But anyhow, and, and, uh, but anyway, so that, uh, David goes out there and he walked across there with his slingshot and his little old five smooth stones. And, and some people always ask the question, why did he take five? If I was fighting a giant, I'd have took ten. You know. But David wasn't worried about how many rocks. He wasn't worried about anything. Because he was standing in the gap. And he knew. Because he'd already told David, uh, Saul, and you know, got Saul all excited, man. He was, he was, they, Saul was his, you know, now Saul was his cheerleader. Go on, boy. Let's get it. Come on, go. I'm not going, but you go. I'm not going to do it, but you can do it. You can do it. David said, I know I can do it because God's with me. He said, I took that lion and I took that bear and said, God took care of it. And he said, I'll take care of that bear. And then he, you know, David gets on out there if you read on down the rest of the chapter and it starts telling you about how big the head of, of the last bear is. Weighed 17 pounds. That's just the head of it. That's pretty good size. That's pretty good size weight. Amen. And then, you know, and it talks about his shield. He has, he has one guy that all he does is follow Goliath and carry his shield, his shield. And that was a pretty good job for him. But nonetheless, and so now, so David gets out there, and the next thing you know, Goliath falls. The battle's over. He said, how come? Somebody, somebody was standing the gap. See, that's our problem. We've got a race to run, but see, we're not worried about running our race. We're wondering about where we're going to be when we get where we're at. Yeah. We're wondering about what we want to do. See, we're wondering, you know, I, I think this is what I want to make out of my life. I think this is what I want to be. God's not interested in what you want to be. He's interested in what he wants you to be. He's wanting you to be somebody that stand in the gap. He's wanting you to be somebody that will intercede, make intercessions for those that are lost and those that are having troubles and trials and those that are going through great trials in their lives and, and finding persecution as being Christian. He's wanting you to do those things. He's wanting you to stand in the gap. Yeah, he's, he's wanting you and I to understand there's an honor, there's a great honor in being a child of God. Whether you like it or not, you are considered one of the saints. Mighty man of valor. And we look at David's life and we realize that he inspired courage to stand. And, and everybody began to cheer him on. They cheered him on. If just one person will stand in the gap, the whole, the whole army will begin to become brave. But it takes somebody. It takes somebody. And you say, well, you know, what could I do? Well, you can start praying. That's what happened years and years ago in, the, in Europe and all that. The one man started praying and women started praying and others started praying and all of a sudden they got great revival through the land. That's what happened in America. When Jonathan Edwards and all those began to start preaching again and things began to start happening again, the first thing you know we had a, 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 an awakening in America and, and Christianity began to rise again and become what it was. But now what's happened? We forgot. Stand in the gap. We forgot that, hey, it takes us. It takes us. You know, we begin to think about that. Not only did he inspire courage, he inspired confidence that any of them could do it in every way, in every situation. And he in inspired conviction, inspired great conviction that they could do what needed to be done. See, we've got to realize that we've got to do right. Go with me, if you would, on over to 2 Samuel, if you would, chapter 23, 2 Samuel 23, because see, this, this man that stepped in the gap didn't just do one thing. He didn't do one thing. And, and you know, he had already, already been crowned king, or not crowned, but anointed to be king, but uh, he was waiting for his time. And Saul didn't like it. Saul didn't like it because everybody liked, everybody liked David. David was a likable guy. 
Saul wasn't a likable guy. He had an evil spirit and everything else. But notice, if you would, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll notice here if you would, and uh, let me be sure I've got the right chapter here, 2 Samuel. And uh, then uh, verse 23, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kelah. And, and they goes on down, and so David said unto men, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. And, uh, and they go on down and goes on down. And, and then notice, if you would, in verse 20, chapter 24 and verse number 1, And it came to pass when Saul was entered from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And I'm in chapter 4 now. I jumped real fast to get over where I wanted to go, okay? Chapter 24. And then in verse 2, Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David. Now, I want you to think about this. This is the king, head and shoulders above everybody else. And... uh, He's looking for one guy with a few little men. Uh, at one time, he got about three or 400, you know, men that were uh, dismayed and everything else. They were, not very, they were not very good. In fact, they were just the, the, the scourge, scourge of the earth, you know, but David took them. And now Saul now is taking, notice what it said. Saul is now taking 3,000 chosen men to find this one little stripling of a boy. Oh, but he's going to become a man a mighty man of valor. He's become the apple of God's eye. You know, I want you to think about this. God's looking for somebody that'll stand in the gap. Doesn't make any difference where he's at. And he's wanting wanting him not only to inspire people to get into the battle, but he wants them to stand. Inspire them to stand for what we believe. We believe. Stand strong. Don't be willing to sacrifice it in any manner. Stand strong. Let everybody know that you're an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist, that this is an inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. And then stand with conviction. And so now David now has a good time. Now notice, if you would, verse 3. And he came to the sheepfold by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. Now, for you children and all, that means he's going to sneak in there and use the bathroom. Okay. But he does it in private. Okay. And so he goes in there, and, and so David's men said, you've got your chance now. You've got your chance. Just cut his head off. Just cut his head off. And so David sneaks in there, gets Saul's robe, and he cuts the, the bottom of it off, the bottom off his shirt, and he sneaks out with it. And the men said, why didn't you kill him? Why didn't you kill him? Notice, if you would, in verse number uh, 5 of this. And it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's coat. See, there's one thing you don't do. You don't touch God's anointed. Uh Uh-uh. No, you don't. You don't touch God's anointed. And notice, if you would, the next verse. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. He was trying to kill David. But what David called him? His master. He's still his king. And he wasn't going to do anything wrong. He was going to, he was going to live right by his convictions because the word of God doesn't change. Convictions do not change. Preferences do, but not convictions. Convictions is what you'll live for. And David was going to live for his king. He wasn't going to take the king's life because he was a man that stood in the gap. He's the one that brought David, I mean, brought Saul courage when he was afraid. Didn't have one man to fight, but a little kid would. A little kid would. Isn't it amazing that God says that we must have childlike faith? Just believing. Just believing. Oh, but we don't do that. We've got all the questions. But what if this happens? What if that happens? What if the other happens? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's the preaching of the Word of God, the Word of God, the preaching of it. You you, you say, well, no, no, it's just reading it. No, it's not. You go back and read Romans chapter 10 and see what he's talking about. He said they don't hear except they don't believe without a preacher, and they don't preach unless they be sent. And then he tells them in verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The preaching of the Word of God that convicts hearts and souls just like David was doing. 
And he was telling his men, you don't do that. You don't do that. You do not do that to your master. And he wanted them to understand it. Notice he goes on. So David arose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stood with his face to the earth and bowed. He's still king. And he still desired all the respect that was there. And when he went on, and David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou, uh, uh, thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? He said, You've heard all these lies. Why don't you listen to what you what you've heard me say? That I love you. I care for you. I've fought every kind of battle for you. And when I went out to find get Goliath, you know, one of the war- rewards was supposed to be me as I was going to get your daughter. Oh, I did, but that didn't last long, did it? Because you got mad at me. But I knew what she looked like because I used to see her when I would strum, strum the little old harp for you and you'd finally get a ease from your old evil heart. David knew all about her. Now David also now was holding up that skirt and he said, see this? Now believe me, believe me, quit believing what you hear someplace else. Hear me. Hear me, not the words you're hearing from someplace else. Open the word of God. Read the stories of the men and the women that would stand in the gap and and teach convictions and and stand for courage and encourage others to understand. All we've got to do is run the race. Just run the race. Just run the race. Sometimes it's tough. Now, it's not a triathlon. You've got to do more than three things. It's not just swimming and running and bicycling. It's more like what they call a a Spartan race now. You go through mud. You go through barbed wire. You go through, you know, bicycle and mountains. and er You go through everything. That's the Christian life. It's not a timed race. All of us run different periods of time. It's not the same start and finish. The only problem is we do know this. When we get to the end, that's our goal. And there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not to me only, but for all those that love his appearing. Oh, it's going to be a day when you get there. It's going to be a day. You say, well, I'm I'm not anxious to get there. I don't know that anybody's anxious to get there, but you better have your ticket punched. If you ain't got your ticket punched, you ain't going. And I know that's not good English, but it doesn't make any difference. You're not going to make it. You just ain't going to make it. If you haven't come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, let me not only give you a ticket, I'm going to punch it so you're ready to go because I'm going to come in a twinkling of an eye. And you better be ready. You better be ready. Well, we could go on and on and notice as we move on, and the Lord judged between me and thee, and the Lord's avenged me. I'm verse 12 of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to give you any problems. I'm not going to do any of that. You know, he was willing to stand in the gap. He was willing to take all those sins that so easily beset him because he was popular with the people. Saul couldn't stand it. He couldn't stand it. But see, all David was doing was doing what God wanted him to do. Just doing what God wanted him to do. Where will you be when you get where you're going? Huh? I'm not asking you where you want to be. I'm asking where will you be? Where will you be when you get where you're going? With your present journey and your present your present convictions, your present goal in your life, especially you young people, where are you going to be when you get where you're going? Is it going to be one that's going to honor God and you're going to have been able to bring many souls to Christ? Is it going to be where that you, when you walk that people will look at you and say, I'm sure glad they're standing in the gap. It makes a difference. I'm glad that when God said, okay, this is your course, this is your course, that they just put on their jacket, and slipped on their shoes and said, just point me to right where you want me to go, Lord. Point me where you want me to go. 
you know, Miss Johnson and I, you know, in 2012, at the end of the year, we came to the, we thought was the end of our road. And so we retired. We're still trying to retire. The Lord took us to James Bowen. We stepped in the gap. It made a difference. Oh, it may not have been much. It wasn't any building like this. But you know what? People were saved. <laughs> Lives were changed. And then Tyler come along, went over and messed everything up. <laughs> you know I'm joking about that. Tyler's doing a good job. And then, then we retired from there in 2017. And then Brother Hudson asked us to come down to Howe and help him. And we went down there for a year and, and helped him. And God blessed our friendship. We were good friends. We couldn't ask for anybody any better. And we think, we think the, the church was helped because we walked along beside him and we could feel the encouragement that he was receiving from people. Are you helping anybody? Huh? Are you helping anybody? Are you encouraging anybody? Are you standing in the gap for anybody? Or are you just taxing along? Huh? Are you just taxing along? I want to live my life to the fullest. I want to be what I can be. I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do that. But wouldn't it be better if you'd be doing what God wanted you to do? Lives would be being saved. Churches would be being built. Missionaries would be being sent. And the kingdom of God would be being honored people would understand there is a right and a wrong and there is people that stand for it just like Grace and Bible Baptist Church did just like Brother Roy did you, you, can, you can count on that and just like when we got ready to build this building and move out here we didn't want to build a building for a building we built this building for ministry. And that's what Brother Roy is using it for, ministry. But you know what? He's got to have all of you standing in the gap. We can't just stand back and say, let somebody else do it. Get on the bandwagon. Step up. Step in. And you'll be surprised what God could do with you. But you know what? You got to be willing. David was. David was willing. And you know when it came to the end of his life, he went out to battle in that last that last battle the old soldier won. And he was just about to get killed. And his men came carried him away and said it's the last time you're going out in the battle because said we can't let anything happen to you because see he had made a difference he was not only one that could stand in the gap but he was the one that trained inspired encouraged and taught men to stand in the gap if you remember there was uh, Adonai I believe that was his name one of the first the first of David's mighty men. And he got out there and with a weaver's beam, he killed 800 men. He had a spear like a weaver's beam. 800 men by himself. And then we come to Eleazar, and there he was in the middle of that lineage path and field and everything else. And, and the enemy came, and everybody else fled. They were all scared. But not him. Why? Because David had shown him what it was to stand in the gap. And he took his sword, the Bible says. And he stood in the middle of that field of uh, 
lineage or pottage, as it said over in, in Genesis. And, and he took that sword and he killed him and killed him and killed him because there was no one left. In fact, it was he had held on his sword so long, the Bible said his hand clave to the sword. It was, it was so, clo- so closed on it that he couldn't even get it loose. All by himself. Why? Because he saw one man always doing right, but always stepping in where he needed to step in. And then, of course, the last one talks about him. And he was the same way, and he began to kill them all. And, and you know, the, the, the only thing that I can see that he had to win all that battle, and I forget how many hundred men it was, was his bare hands. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have a spear. He didn't have any. All he did was just kill them and kill them and kill them and kill them. Uh, then the people came. That's like it was the day when David went out with a slingshot and five smooth stones. And Goliath fell. And David took his sword and cut off his head and carried it back to Saul and said, Saul, here it is. Because there was a cause, and he was willing to stand in the gap. I still have to ask the question again. Are you willing? If you're not, can I ask you why? Do you have so many, do you have so many besetting things that you can't get your heart to God? Is it that the sin? Do you lack faith? in the word of God and in the truth of God's word. Every one of these things that I've shared with you today, these are not Bible stories. These are events in history that is just as real as the pew you're sitting in today by people just like you, but they had faith that God would not fail. Father, we thank you today for your love and your goodness to us. And now as we come to this moment of invitation, Father, the the challenge is before us. It's, It's not that we can't. It's not that we can't. It's that we must, we must decide. We must choose to do what you want us to do. You have a race for us to run. So help us, Father. Help us. Help us to commit ourselves to get in the battle and fill the gap. And, Father, as we give this invitation, would you speak to the hearts of your people? Let us all understand that it's, it's our fight. You were cut off from the land of the living. You left it for us to do. Now, we must do it. I pray, Father, you'll bless now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand to your feet if you would as your heads are bowed.